This is where the majority of our students live. Pretty much it all exploded all at once. They had so many people wanting housing that they had to put a third person in some of those rooms. Here on top of Maysmith Hall is one of the best views of campus in my opinion. Hey Salukis, I'm Jeff Gleam, Executive Director of the SIU Alumni Association, and welcome to another edition of Saluki Sleuths. In this episode, we're going across to East Campus to explore some of the largest buildings on campus, more affectionately known as the Towers. Here's Anna Toomey with more. Tall, concrete, and very durable. It's one of the first things students see when they arrive on campus. At 17 stories high, the East Campus Towers are the tallest buildings in Carbondale. Right now, we're seeing a lot of alumni bringing their children and moving them in. Jim Hunsaker works for University Housing as the Senior Associate Director of Operations. Uh, and they're reminiscing about, well, we did this and I met my best friend here uh, while I lived in, in Maysmith and I met the best man of my wedding while I lived in Maysmith and I met my spouse while I lived in Maysmith. So it's, it's a situation where uh, it, it's a generational experience for our students at this point. Jim has been with SIU for more than 20 years. In his role right now, he works with students and parents before they arrive to SIU's largest housing option. I'm over the contracting process. We deal with the students and the uh, parents uh, before the students arrive on campus. And then our residence life team takes them over after they're moved in and arrived, but we help them contract. Uh, we answer all of their questions. We are the customer service department for university housing. Jim takes us on a tour of the May Smith Tower and shows us how much has changed over the years. May Smith is kind of a unique building over here on uh, East Campus in the towers because it is the uh, College of Health and Human Sciences, LLC. So that college is taking up this entire building. Um, all of their majors are now located in one building. It's been very successful. So housing now is built on an LLC or a living learning community model where students in the same college or with the same interest will live in the same area. Neely Hall was the first tower to be built in 1965. That was stage one of the University Park project that also included Allen, Boomer, Wright, and Trueblood Halls. May Smith and Schneider Halls were finished just a few years after Neely Hall in 1968. Each tower can house up to 816 students. Surrounding the towers are Grinnell Hall and Trueblood Commons, two areas that have also seen significant changes. Uh, Grinnell Hall is no longer uh, a dining hall. Uh, it's actually program space now, so that'll be different from the, for the alumni. Uh, we used to have three dining halls operating uh, on campus. Right now we only have two, and that's True Blood and Lentz Hall. Uh, True Blood, the dining hall, has been renovated uh, with a Mongolian grill. Um, within the last five years. It's really popular with our students. The first floor of May Smith has been completely renovated within the last year and is the most recent tower to get a facelift. This is the lobby of May Smith Hall and the College of Health and Human Sciences uh, house their living learning community in this building. So they have really spent a lot of money uh, making this their home. Uh, all of their majors are living in this building. Uh, we have uh, recreational pool tables, uh, charging stations, um, study space, and meeting space here for, uh, for all of our students. Jim takes us up the elevator to show us what the rooms look like. Laundry is now free for all of our students, uh, so they don't have to have a pocket full of quarters to come in and do their, and do do their laundry. Yeah. It, he says the towers are home to the largest student dorm rooms in the state. So this is the typical uh, room here in the towers, uh, May Smith. Uh, we've updated all of our mattresses to uh, bed bug proof uh, mattresses so that our students and parents don't have that concern. Uh, we've just recently, uh, last year, we did a complete Wi-Fi upgrade in the towers, so the Wi-Fi um, is probably the best on campus. The typical setup in May Smith consists of two rooms attached to one bathroom. 
They can rearrange this furniture any way they want to. They can bunk the beds, loft the beds, uh, stick the desk underneath the beds, uh, as long as the furniture stays in the room. Sophomore Bella Meineke lives in Neely Hall and gives us a tour of her decorated dorm room. So I have a lot of extra furniture because I thrifted a lot of stuff and I would just like to tell everybody know that it is possible to get really cheap furniture. My cubicle over here was five dollars and this is where I have all my perfumes and my DVDs and then we have two sets of furniture in every dorm so we have my first desk, which is my study desk, and this room divider that I made to hide the mess. This is my mess corner. So we have some random stuff back there, a chair for chilling so that we don't have to be on the bed all the time. I bunked my beds and I used one as a shelf. That's my tip to everybody. Use your second bed as a shelf. And then here's some more thrifted furniture. I upcycled this. This is actually from Walmart, but it was less than $20. We head up several more floors to a secret location alumni from the 80s know very well. So back when I was a student in the 80s, uh, the sun decks on top of the uh, towers were always a popular place for our students. Um, while the sun decks are no longer uh, accessible by students, a lot of the old signage is still up here and we can go out there and check it out now. The sun decks have obviously changed uh, since the 80s. There used to be railing all the way around them, uh, benches for the students to sit on. Uh, the rules and the, uh, uh, the, the old signage is still, while it's faded, it's still uh, put up up here. And this one is the rules for the sun deck and it's basically all of the rules with the final comment being do your part so we don't close the sun deck. Here on top of Maysmith Hall is one of the best views of campus in my opinion. Directly behind me, you'll see Neely Hall, of course. We move over to the engineering building, the student center, student services, and just behind there, Fainer Hall. And over here on the north facing side, we can see the rec center, downtown Carbondale. We keep walking, we hit the wall and grand apartments. The towers are a symbol of a time when the student population was exploding at Southern Illinois University. In the 64, the enrollment was still a little below 4,000, but in 65, the enrollment jumped to 12,000, and that was a surprise to everybody. C.W. Thomas came to Southern Illinois as a young boy in the early 60s. SIU hired his father to assist in the planning process for each of the towers. When the towers were built, Delight Morris was president of SIU. There was a time when President Morris was literally going from house to house in Carbondale asking residents if they had an extra room that they'd be willing to let out to the students that the university would help reimburse them for. That's, that's how desperate times got there for a while. These photos show the official dedication of Brush Towers in June of 1968, archived thanks to the dedicated work of Morris Library. Neely Hall was technically part of an area known as University Park, while May Smith and Schneider were known as Brush Towers, named after Carbondale's founder, Daniel Brush. My understanding was is that Neely was built first, and then Schneider and May Smith. And then the names all came from... Uh, university instructors. There is, a, there was a person named Neely. There was a person named Schneider and May Smith. Uh, and same thing with Thompson Point. All those buildings out there are all named after academic people who, t who taught or were administrators. Patrick Brumlevy started with university housing back in 1986 and worked for the department until August 2014. Patrick is also an SIU alum with a background in history. He ended up doing research about the housing area now known as East Campus. But at the time when I was involved, you, uh, the biggest thing was the population. It was completely full. And in fact, it was so full that in the fall, they had what they called over assigned rooms. And there was two rooms to each floor that they put a third person in. I always remembered uh, when I worked for the contracts office, Every year we would go out to the areas and let people sign up for the next year wherever they wanted to live in a room. And the big question always was is 
uh, in the towers was, is this an L-shaped room? And what they meant was, is the sink was around the corner. One room, the sink was kind of like in the middle of the room, uh, room against the wall, and then in the L-shaped room, the sink was around a corner, and it, everyone liked that, liked those rooms for some reason. Patrick says near the end of his time with housing, there were discussions about tearing the towers down. For similar reasons, a housing area known as the Triads were torn down. The Triads consisted of Allen, Boomer, and Wright Halls, and they were demolished in 2012. The university was looking to build residence halls that were easier to manage. And that's why the Triads got torn down, because the plan was, okay, we're going to tear down the triads and start building those smaller five or six story buildings that would be easier to administer and everything. But I think once they started really looking into the cost and everything, it's just like, no, let's just keep the towers. C.W. Thomas grew up around the towers and can remember visiting his father who had an office in True Blood. When we got here, this was all just a big forest area. In the 60s, university housing kept men and women in separate areas. Neely and Mae Smith initially only housed women, while men lived in Schneider. Single undergraduate women had an 11.30 p.m. curfew. If you were a guy, you had to ask for permission to visit down in the lounge, and you had to be have a chaperone for that. Times have changed significantly, yet so much about the towers has stayed the same. Generations of Salukis have lived here, then moved their own kids in decades later. For me, the towers just mean stability and that they were here three years, they were built three years after we got here and they're still here, I don't know, what's, what's that? 60 years later, maybe? The towers are good. They're, they're, they're good buildings. They're still, you know, very usable. If they keep up on the maintenance and everything, the, the, I, my, that's my, you know, personal opinion. I think they're still good buildings. Well, that wraps up another episode of Saluki Sluice. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I want to thank everybody across campus for their contributions to this story. And I want to keep encouraging you to send in your ideas. And until we see each other again, go dogs. <laughs>